Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on a review of A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Not so short, it's about 680 pages, although about the last hundred or so um, are the notes and bibliography. As always, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through it and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. Bill Bryson describes himself as a reluctant traveller. But even when he stays safely at home, he can't contain his curiosity about the world around him. A short history of nearly everything is his quest to understand everything that's happened from the Big Bang to the rise of civilization, How we got from there, being nothing at all, to here, being us. The ultimate eye-opening journey through time and space, revealing the world in a way most of us have never seen it before. So, let's check out some tabs. So this is a fact that I've heard about before, um, but I think it's an interesting one. Possibly a little bit re less relevant now because we all use digital TV and stuff, but... Uh, incidentally, disturbance from cosmic background radiation is something we have all experienced. Tune your television to any channel it doesn't receive and about 1% of the dancing static you see is accounted for by this ancient remnant of the Big Bang. The next time you complain that there is nothing on, remember that you can always watch the birth of the universe. And he talks about Pluto and he says, uh, relative to the planet, it has the biggest moon in the solar system. This was actually something of a blow to Pluto's status as a planet, which had never been terribly robust anyway. Since previously the space occupied by the moon and the space occupied by Pluto were thought to be one and the same, it meant that Pluto was much smaller than anyone had supposed, smaller even than Mercury. Indeed, seven moons in the solar system, including our own, are larger. And obviously since this book has come out, Pluto has been demoted and is no longer a planet. But he actually says here, which is why perhaps it is good news that in February 1999, the International Astronomical Union ruled officially that Pluto is a planet. The universe is a big and lonely place. We can do with all the neighbours we get. Well, alas, Bill, we have lost the neighbour. It has been demoted. And uh, we learn a little bit about Isaac Newton here, and he sounds mental. Newton was a decidedly odd figure, brilliant beyond measure, but solitary, joyless, prickly to the point of paranoia, famously distracted. Upon swinging his feet out of bed in the morning, he would reportedly sometimes sit for hours, immobilised by the sudden rush of thoughts to his head, and capable of the most riveting strangeness. He built his own laboratory, the first at Cambridge, but then engaged in the most bizarre experiments. Once he inserted a bodkin, a long needle of the sort used for sewing leather, into his eye socket and rubbed it round, betwixt my eye and the bone as near to the backside of my eye as I could, just to see what would happen. What happened, miraculously, was nothing, at least nothing lasting. On another occasion, he stared at the sun for as long as he could bear to determine what effect it would have upon his vision. Again, he escaped lasting damage, though he had to spend some days in a darkened room before his eyes forgave him. So he almost had a blind Isaac Newton. Uh, and Dr. James Parkinson, who, um, you know, was known for his work on identifying Parkinson's disease, it says, He had one other slight claim to fame. In 1785, he became possibly the only person in history to win a natural history museum in a raffle. The museum, in London's Leicester Square, had been founded by Sir Ashton Lever, who had driven himself bankrupt with his unrestrained collecting of natural wonders. Parkinson kept the museum until 1805, when he could no longer support it and the collection was broken up and sold. He mentions that uh, mastodon, which means uh, nipple teeth, and um, this is really fascinating and especially good for like uh, an early mention of a woman in the sciences. Paleontological momentum had moved to England. In 1812, at Lyme Regis on the Dorset coast, an extraordinary child named Mary Anning, aged 11, 12 or 13, depending on whose account you read, found a strange fossilised sea monster, 17 feet long and now known as the Ichiosaurus, embedded in the steep and dangerous cliffs along the English Channel. It was the start of a remarkable career. Anning would spend the next 35 years gathering fossils, which she sold to visitors. She is commonly held to be the source for the famous tongue twister, she sells seashells on the seashore. She would also find the first Plesiosaurus, another marine monster, and one of the first and best pterodactyls. Though none of these was technically a dinosaur, that wasn't terribly relevant at the time since nobody then knew what a dinosaur was. It was enough to realise that the world had once held creatures strikingly unlike anything we might now find. And here we learn about uh, Richard Owen. Owen had grown up in Lancaster in the north of England, where he had trained as a doctor. He was a born anatomist and so devoted to his studies that he sometimes illicitly borrowed limbs, organs and other parts from corpses and took them home for leisurely dissection. Once, while carrying a sack containing the head of a black African sailor that he had just removed, Owen slipped on a wet cobble and watched in horror as the head bounced away from him down the lane and through the open doorway of a cottage where it came to rest in the front parlour. What the occupants had to say upon finding an unattached head rolling to a halt at their feet can only be imagined. One assumes that they had not formed any terribly advanced conclusions when, an instant later, 
A fraught looking young man rushed in, wordlessly retrieved the head and rushed out again. It says, in the early 1800s there arose in England a fashion for inhaling nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, after it was discovered that its use was attended by a highly pleasurable thrilling. And um, obviously that's still popular today. Where I used to live, there used to be laughing gas canisters in the car park all the time from the druggies. And we get a reference to something I've heard before, but it's just interesting to see it again. That uh, uh, Mary Curie's um, note lab books, um, they're now too dangerous, even now they're too dangerous to handle. Even our cookbooks are too dangerous to handle, and that's from the 1890s. They're kept in lead-lined boxes, and those who wish to see them must don protective clothing. All right, so we learn here about Planck. Uh, what was it? Max Planck is his name? I can't remember. Where, where was he introduced? Yeah, Max Planck. And we have a footnote here. Planck was often unlucky in life. His beloved first wife died early in 1909, and the younger of his two sons was killed in the First World War. He also had twin daughters whom he adored. One died giving birth. The surviving twin went to look after the baby and fell in love with her sister's husband. They married and two years later, she died in childbirth. In 1944, when Planck was 85, an Allied bomb fell on his house and he lost everything, papers, diary, a lifetime of accumulations. The following year, his surviving son was caught in a conspiracy to assassinate Hitler and executed. He really was an unlucky man. So Bryson says, you may not feel astoundingly robust, but if you're an average sized adult, you will contain within your modest frame no less than seven times 10 to the power of 18 joules of potential energy, enough to explode with a force of 30 very large hydrogen bombs, assuming you knew how to liberate it and really wish to make a point. Everything has this kind of energy trapped within it. We're just not very good at getting it out. Even a uranium bomb, the most energetic thing we have produced yet, releases less than 1% of the energy it could release if only we were more cunning. I thought this was funny as well. Physics are notoriously scornful of scientists from other fields. When the great Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli's wife left him for a chemist, he was staggered with disbelief. Had she taken a bullfighter, I would have understood, he remarked in wonder to a friend. But a chemist? And we learn about Rutherford here. Physically, he was big and booming, with a voice that made the timid shrink. Once, when told that Rutherford was about to make a radio broadcast across the Atlantic, a colleague dryly asked, why use radio? We get a little reference to Isaac Asimov, literally so little that it's not even worth reading out or further highlighting. And um, Patterson was doing some tests. It says it took him seven years of patient work just to find and measure suitable samples for final testing. When at last he had his results, Patterson was so excited that he drove straight to his boyhood home in Iowa and had his mother check him into a hospital because he thought he was having a heart attack. And as a, a sufferer of anxiety, I know that feeling very well. And um, I remember this being a big concern when the Large Hadron Collider was turned on, which was after this book came out. Fears have been raised that in their enthusiasm, scientists might inadvertently create a black hole or even something called strange quarks, which could, theoretically, interact with other subatomic particles and propagate uncontrollably. If you're reading this, that hasn't happened. <laughs> this just makes me laugh as well, he said. Although quarks are much too small to have colour or taste or any other physical characteristics we would recognise, they became clumped into six categories, up, down, strange, charm, top and bottom, which physicists oddly refer to as their flavours, and these are further divided into the colours red, green and blue. One suspects that it was not altogether coincidental that these terms were first applied in California during the age of psychedelia. And we're learning about uh, plate tectonics and we get Interestingly, oil company geologists had known for years that if you wanted to find oil, you had to allow for precisely the sort of surface movements that were implied by plate tectonics. But oil geologists didn't write academic papers, they just found oil. And I love this as well, this I actually was telling some of my friends about. By the standards of today, crater research in the early 1900s was a trifle unsophisticated to say the least. The leading early investigator, G. G.K. Gilbert of Columbia University modelled the effects of impacts by flinging marbles into pans of oatmeal. And we learn about um, John Scott Haldane, it said, he was famously absent-minded. Once after his wife had sent him upstairs to change for a dinner party, he failed to return and was discovered asleep in bed in his pyjamas. When roused, Haldane explained that he had found himself disrobing and assumed it was bedtime. That's the kind of thing I would do. And uh, Haldane's son, it says, uh, in one experiment, he simulated a dangerously hasty ascent to see what would happen because they were testing uh, the bends. What happened was that the dental fillings in his teeth exploded. Almost every experiment, Norton writes, ended with someone having a seizure, bleeding or vomiting. On another occasion, while poisoning himself with elevated levels of oxygen, Haldane had a fit so severe that he crushed several vertebrae. Collapsed lungs were a routine hazard. Perforated eardrums were quite common too, but as Haldane reassuringly noted in one of his essays, the drum generally heals up, and if a hole remains in it, although one is somewhat deaf, 
one can blow tobacco smoke out of the ear in question, which is a social accomplishment. And then he's talking about um, the sea, basically, and how little we know of it. At the surface level, investigative techniques have also been a trifle ad hoc. In 1994, 34,000 ice hockey gloves were swept overboard from a Korean cargo ship during a storm in the Pacific. The gloves washed up all over, from Vancouver to Vietnam, helping oceanographers to trace currents more accurately than they ever had before. We get a reference to Richard Dawkins' The Blind Watchmaker, which I have read, did enjoy. And he's talking to, um, to uh, a geologist, I think. I think a geologist. Um, they've got a poster on the wall showing an artist's interpretation of the Earth as it might have looked 3.5 billion years ago. And they say, well, one school of thought was that it was actually cool then because the sun was much weaker. I later learned that biologists, when they are feeling jocose, refer to this as the Chinese restaurant problem because we had a dim sun. And here, I've heard about this dis dis disease, it's awful. The scariest, most out of control bacterial disorder of the moment is a disease called necrotizing fasciitis, in which bacteria essentially eat the victim from the inside out, devouring internal tissue and leaving behind a pulpy, noxious residue. Patients often come in with comparatively mild complaints, a skin rash and fever typically, but then dramatically deteriorate. When they are opened up, it is often found that they are simply being consumed. The only treatment is what is known as radical excisional surgery, cutting out every bit of infected area. 70% of victims die. Many of the rest are left terribly disfigured. And here, this is something that I know a lot about because team vegan, so I know a fair amount about factory farming, more than I would like to know, to be honest. Um, he says, we would have much more success with bacteria if we weren't so profligate with our best weapon against them, antibiotics. Remarkably, by one estimate, some 70% of the antibiotics used in the developed world are given to farm animals, often routinely in stock feed, simply to promote growth or as a precaution against infection. Such applications give bacteria every opportunity to evolve a resistance to them. It is an opportunity that they have enthusiastically seized. And he's writing about the, um, the Spanish flu, which is obviously very relevant these days because of COVID. In an attempt to devise a vaccine, medical authorities conducted experiments on volunteers at a military prison on Deer Island in Boston Harbour. The prisoners were promised pardons if they survived a battery of tests. These tests were rigorous, to say the least. First, the subjects were injected with infected lung tissue taken from the dead and then sprayed in the eyes, nose and mouth with infectious aerosols. If they still failed to succumb, they had their throats swabbed with discharges taken straight from the sick and dying. If all else failed, they were required to sit open mouth while a gravely ill victim was sat up slightly and made to cough into their faces. Out of, somewhat amazingly, 300 men who volunteered, the, jo the doctors chose 62 for the tests. None contracted the flu, not one. The only person who did grow ill was the ward doctor who swiftly died. The probable explanation for this is that the epidemic had passed through the prison a few weeks earlier and the volunteers, all of whom had survived that visitation, had a natural immunity. And he says, no one can rule out the possibility that the great swine flu epidemic might once again rear its head. And if it doesn't, others well might. And obviously it did. And so the, um, it says the, the KT event, which is the uh, meteorite that killed the dinosaurs, it struck with a force of 100 million megatons. Such an outburst is not easily imagined, but as James Lawrence Powell has pointed out, if you exploded one Hiroshima-sized bomb for every person alive on Earth today, you would still be about a billion bombs short of the size of the KT impact. But actually, since this book came out, we've grown by about a billion in terms of our population. And it's talking about uh, bed bugs and mites. Your pillow alone may be home to 40,000 of them. And don't think a clean pillowcase will make a difference. To something on the scale of bed mites, the weave of the tightest human fabric looks like ship's rigging. Indeed, if your pillow is six years old, which is apparently about the average age for a pillow, it has been estimated that one tenth of its weight will be made up of sloughed skin, living mites, dead mites, and mite dung, to quote the man who did the measuring. And I love this, it goes on to Darwin and Darwinism. In the late summer or early autumn of 1859, Whitwell Elwin, editor of the respected British journal The Quarterly Review, was sent an advanced copy of a new book by the naturalist Charles Darwin. Elwin read the book with interest and agreed that it had merit, but feared that the subject matter was too narrow to attract a wide audience. He urged Darwin to write a book about pigeons instead. Everyone is interested in pigeons, he observed helpfully. Fortunately for us, Darwin ignored that advice. We get a reference to Chagas disease, um, which is quite an obscure one, but I was actually looking at it recently because I'm writing a, an art, a video script for a client about the um, the most deadly bugs uh, and insects, uh, most dangerous rather, but one of them is because they transmit Chagas' disease. 
I, I love this as well. And I've read on the origin of species, but it has been some time now. Ironically, considering that Darwin called his book on the origin of species, the one thing he couldn't explain was how species originated. And here we learn, well we're learning about DNA, but he goes on to how like DNA analysis for crime was, was you know, started off. Junk DNA does have a use. It is the portion employed in DNA fingerprinting. Its practicality for this purpose was discovered accidentally by Alec Jeffries, a scientist at the University of Leicester. In 1986, Jeffries was studying DNA sequences for genetic markers associated with heritable diseases when he was approached by the police and asked if he could help connect a suspect to two murders. He realised his technique ought to work perfectly for solving criminal cases, and so it proved. A young baker with the improbable name of Colin Pitchfork was sentenced to two life terms in prison for the murders. So he says here a few disorders, haemophilia, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease and cystic fibrosis for example, are caused by lone dysfunctional genes. But as a rule, disruptive genes are weeded out by natural selection long before they can become permanently troublesome to a species or population. And I just thought that was interesting because I recently did, I had my DNA sequence to find my genetic heritage and I also looked into markers for potential um, you know hereditary diseases so that was just kind of relevant to that and this just tells you a lot about people in the meantime, back on Dubois's old turf of Java, a team led by Ralph von Koenigswald had found another group of early humans which became known as the Solo people from the site of their discovery on the Solo River at Nangdong. Koenigswald's discoveries might have been more impressive still, but for a tactical error that was realised too late. He had offered locals 10 cents for every piece of hominid bone they could come up with, then discovered to his horror that they had been enthusiastically smashing large pieces into small ones to maximise their income. I've heard this story as well. Um, so we go on to extinction. A great deal of extinction, Flannery and Sheldon discovered, hasn't been cruel or wanton, but just kind of majestically foolish. In 1894, when a lighthouse was built on a lonely rock called Stevens Island in the tempestuous strait between the North and South Islands of New Zealand, the lighthouse keeper's cat kept bringing him strange little birds that he had caught. The keeper dutifully sent some specimens to the museum in Wellington. There, a curator grew very excited because the bird was a relic species of flightless wrens, the only example of a flightless perching bird ever found anywhere. He set off at once for the island, but by the time he got there, the cat killed them all. Twelve stuffed museum species of the Stevens Island flightless wren are all that now exist. As a cat owner as well, I can relate to that. He's sitting over there cleaning himself as though he wouldn't kill a rare flightless wren. So yeah, a short history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson. It really does what it says on the tin. It's one of the most approachable science books I've come across. Bear in mind it is obviously super long, um, but it's very engaging. Like I read this over three or four days and just really just wolfed it down and really enjoyed reading it. In fact, I went straight on to reading At Home, which he kind of wrote as a follow-up, which looks at like home life. And I've been wolfing this down as well. I enjoyed both of them. So as you can tell, do recommend this one to anyone with an interest in science in general and the history of science in particular. I gave this a strong four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of short history of nearly everything by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit the subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.